Harpers Island wetlands, the making of a nature reserve. You might ask, where is Harpers Island? Harpers Island is situated right on the northern shores of the harbour. And if you move in a little bit closer, uh, you will find that Harpers Island is sandwiched between Fort Island and Glanton Village. So uh, the N25 motorway stroke dual carriageway runs right across it uh, as well. Now, I'll give you a brief history of the island. One of the earliest references to Harper's Island is from the Down Survey from the middle of the, the, the 1600s. And when you look at what they produced, it is quite fascinating. Here is the map from 1655. And sure enough, circled in red there for you, is Harper's Island. Uh, so this is one of the earliest maps that I've been able to find clearly showing Harper's Island on it. But if you drill down further into the information on the Down Survey, which is most of which is available online, uh, you will find fantastic maps of almost every part of Ireland. And Harper's Island is there. Uh, and it was called Harper Island in 1655. And also very interestingly, if you see underneath the letters AR and PA, and that means arable pasture, which means that even in the 1650s, Harper's Island was being farmed. So, uh, you know, it shows that the island has been occupied and used for, for many centuries. Now, we don't know very much about Harper's Island between then and the early part of the 19th century when the first Ordnance Survey maps were produced. In 1888, a hurling tournament took place on Harper's Island. And I'm pretty sure that that took place in an area that had been claimed. A seawall had been put around part of the estuary. I'll show you that in a minute. And so it resulted in dead flat uh, land being created and uh, I'm sure that's where the tournament took place. In 1931 there was actually a display of flying at Harper's Island so it has had many uses uh, down through the centuries and here now is a satellite image of Harper's Island from 1655. <laughs> I've used uh, a little bit of Photoshop to recreate, uh, using the, the Down Survey map, what it might have looked like to a migrating wetland bird, like a curlew uh, or an oyster catcher flying at great height over it. And if you come forward then to around 1830, you will see it's changed quite a bit. You can see the area to the north that has been impounded by a big seawall. Uh, and to the south, there was an area also that has been impounded and a little bit to the west. Uh, so it, it doubled in area as a result of this claiming of, of the estuary by using this massive seawall, which was constructed, I reckon, in the early decades of the 1800s. And now you come forward to 2012. And you can see the railway line is, is cutting along the western edge. Uh, the N25 has cut right across Harper's Island as well. And they've used material from the smaller islands to the east in the construction of the dual carriageway. If we zoom in on the 2012 image, this is the area that is Harper's Island Wetlands Nature Reserve. It is the northern part, north of the, the N25. And between then and just last year, you can see clearly the imprint of the work of making Harper's Island Nature Reserve is there to be seen on the satellite image. To the south, it is very clear that you can see part of the nature trail out on the grassland area. And you can see the nature trail as a big, bright white line running down the western side and out onto the road. And you can even also see uh, the areas that we've, we've, we've opened up, the wetland areas called the scrapes that we have opened up uh, as well. Why would you have a nature reserve at Harper's Island, you might ask? Well, going back to our satellite images and you look at where Harper's Island is, I've outlined the nature reserve in yellow and you can see it is surrounded by the estuary. 
mud flats and es the estuary uh, th that is part of Cork Harbour itself. And if you look at the area that I've outlined in this slide in red, there is a lot of really good feeding area for wetland birds that come to Cork Harbour every winter from their breeding grounds, often in the Arctic or further north in Europe. And they get out of there in the winter because it's too harsh and too dark. And they come to somewhere like Ireland uh, where it's never really too cold or never really too warm and there's lots of food. And the area around Harper's Island, Glanton and Slatty Water are, are fantastic areas for the birds uh, when the tide is low. Now, it is also a great place for a very large number of the wetland birds that are in Cork Harbour during the winter because when the tide comes in and covers all the mudflats and shoreline where the birds feed, they are drawn to Harper's Island and a small area of land to the east of it where they have a safe area to rest while the tide is high. And so it's a strategic part of the harbour and therefore is worth conserving and protecting. And the establishment of Harper's Island Nature Reserve was carried out primarily to do this. When you look at the emblem for Harper's Island wetlands, it has a bird on it. And this bird is the black tail godwit. Here it is in winter plumage. You can see the black tail on it. And you could all, almost say that because of this bird, we have Harper's Island wetlands nature reserve. And that is why it is on our logo. They come here in huge numbers. And particularly this time of year, March and April, they gather in big numbers in the Harper's Island area. And they've changed their plumage from the gray you saw in the first photograph to this beautiful rusty breeding plumage. We have counted as much as 4% of the entire world population of the Icelandic black-tailed godwit population in Harper's Island. If there was ever a reason why we should protect an area of wetland, I think that alone is it. It's a huge responsibility for the people of Cork and Ireland to look after these birds when they're in, in our country. I started studying these birds back in the 1990s when I saw one with colour rings on its legs. And I discovered that there was an international project studying the Icelandic black tailed godwits by putting unique combinations of these colour rings on the bird's legs and then hoping people would spot them and report what they saw. These colour rings don't stop them from going about their business. Some have them on for over 20 years and have bred almost every year in Iceland. Uh, and uh, not a problem. So as a result of that, bird watchers in, in Cork and in Ireland and across its range, which is Western Europe, uh, look out for these birds. They record the color combinations, they report them uh, to Iceland, and they then can put together a picture of the detailed movements of these birds. And we're very lucky and fortunate to have one of the most experienced bird ringers uh, in Ireland here in Cork Harbour, Barry O'Mahony. And over the years in Harper's Island, as part of our research into the birds that use it, uh, he has been putting colour rings on some of the godwits that he has caught there. And here is one, uh, just one example from uh, October 2012. And we call it red, red, white, double stripe. Uh, all the godwits that are ringed in Cork have that white uh, ring with the two black stripes on it, hence white double stripe. And the following April, I photographed the same bird out at Harper's Island. It was no longer in winter plumage, it was in breeding plumage. And we heard nothing more about it for a while. Sometimes these birds are not seen again. Some are seen many, many times. Uh, we have found from looking at these that um, we're getting the same birds coming back to us every year. They like Harper's Island and Cork Harbour so much they keep coming back. This particular bird, red, red, white double stripe, was not seen again until one of the leading world experts on Icelandic black-tailed godwits, Thomas Gunnarsson, spotted the exact same bird 
on breeding grounds in Iceland in June 2017. We were over the moon that a bird that we had ringed in Harpers Island on the nature reserve was recited in Iceland. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. But sightings like this, multiple sightings in particular, when you put them all together and do the statistics on them, you discover, amongst other things, where in Iceland, colour ringed godwits seen in Harpers Island wetlands were born. We're pretty sure that all the black tailed godwits that we, we see in Harpers Island were born in Iceland and all go back to Iceland once they're adults to breed every year. But when we look at the data from the sightings of the colouring birds, we were able to find out what part of Iceland our black tailed godwits come from. And we discovered that they mainly come from the southwestern side of Iceland. And that helps us when we're trying to come up with a plan to protect the godwits who are migratory birds, and we want to protect them over their entire range, not just where they winter, like here in Cork Harbour, or not like where they breed, like in the southwest of Iceland. So with this incredibly valuable information, which could never be got without putting colour rings on the birds, we now know exactly the areas we need to target. And if we're having trouble with, with the godwits in Ireland, if the numbers are going down, that can raise an alarm for our friends in Iceland uh, who can then see are the, are the numbers going down where they breed in southwest Iceland. And hopefully we have enough information to try and do something about it. So this, this information, this scientific information is very important. Another example I'll show you uh, why Harpers Island is so important as a place to make a nature reserve. Uh, one evening in 2009, I was studying the Godwits out in Harpers Island and there was 1,700 of them there. That's about 3% of, of the Icelandic population in Harpers Island altogether. And a number of them had colour rings on them. Uh, I took down all the details, sent them off. And when I got back, the sighting histories of these birds, there was about six or seven of them in total. I was able to mark on a map of Europe places they have been. Not necessarily all together. Uh, one individual might have been in four or five of these places. And when you add them all up, you can clearly see how vitally important somewhere like Harpers Island and Cork Harbour is for these migratory birds. Linking together places as far apart as Portugal, France, the Netherlands, uh, Britain, Ireland and Iceland. And again, without putting the colourings on the birds, we would not be able to figure out this out. And this is just for the black-tailed godwit. We have lots of other birds in Harpers Island too. And each one has an equally amazing story. And this is why we need to protect them. So when you go to Harpers Island, we always warn people that sometimes you can go there and you can kind of wonder, what's the big deal about Harpers Island? I can't find anything there. Oh, look, there's three shell duck. And that seems to be it. We, You've done all this work just for three shell duck. Uh, well, it depends on when you go. The summer is very quiet for the wetland birds. They're off breeding on their breeding grounds. But if you're there in the autumn, winter or spring, uh, it's a different matter. And if you get it on a good high tide, like I mentioned already, it can be a very busy place with, with literally thousands of birds in there. So the time of year and the state of the tide are two very important factors when planning a visit to Harpers Island wetlands, especially if you want to see lots of wetland birds. You'll see the oyster catcher. You might see a red shank. They can be quite noisy. Uh, you might even see a curlew. Curlew's been in the news quite a bit. Uh, here's one calling. Their numbers have decreased dramatically in Ireland. They're almost extinct as a breeding species. But when they go to wintering areas like Harpers Island, again, it's important that they have places that are safe and not in danger of being destroyed. And at this time of year, you might see this bird. It looks like a curlew. The beak is actually smaller and it's called a wimbrel. But these birds are migratory. They spend the winter in Africa and they nest in Iceland as well. And some of our Portuguese friends have done lots of studies 
And as we speak, there are Wimbrel passing through Cork Harbour and some stop for a rest at Harpers Island wetlands every year. Uh, and they're heading for Iceland, but they've spent the winter in West Africa. And studies have shown that on the way up, they tend to stop off. But in the autumn, when they're finished breeding, they fly the 5,000 kilometers in less than a week, nonstop. Incredible, a story of another bird that relies on places like Harpers Island wetlands for its very survival. And Harpers Island is like a stepping stone for them. Very, very important on the way north from their wintering grounds in Africa. If they lose these places, and each one has an equally amazing story. And we even get rare wetland birds sometimes, such as this American golden plover, blown all the way across the Atlantic and turn up in harpers. And that's why a lot of bird watchers love to bird watch. You never know what's going to turn up. And it's the same when you visit Harpers Island. It's different every day. It's not a zoo. So you are not guaranteed to see all the birds every time. But what you are guaranteed is a, a surprise almost every time you go down there. And that's what makes it fascinating. And that's the other aspect of setting up uh, the nature reserve is to provide a place where people can go and learn about the birds and all the other creatures uh, that are living on their doorstep. And the, the, the setting up of the reserve has helped us do that. And we get not just the, the, the wetland birds, the waders, we also get things like the common tern. And again, Barry O'Mahony has done some work on the common terns that breed in the harbour. And we've discovered that these birds go to places like Togo in Africa for the winter. And these birds regularly come into Harper's Island during the summer and they hunt for small fish and shrimps in the shallow water uh, within the nature reserve. So it's important for these birds that are coming here for the summer to breed the wading birds uh, like the godwits and that and the oyster catchers and the curlews, they've all moved away for the summer to breed. And in comes birds like the common tern. Uh, sailors used to call it the sea swallow because of the forked tail. We also get the the, the common or garden swallow uh, in Harpers Island as well. Sometimes they nest in the viewing heights. And since we've opened, quite a number of people have actually managed to see their first kingfisher from our viewing heights, which has been a fantastic uh, reward for all of us that have been involved in setting it up because kingfishers are often very difficult to see. But uh, on a number of occasions, we've had kingfishers come in regularly during the winter. They don't breed there, but they come there for the winter. So it's been fascinating for people to see these, uh, what you call iconic species uh, that they've only ever read about or seen photographs of, and yet they've been able to come to Harpers Island and see them. And when you're on your, the nature trail, you will also see some of our countryside birds like the stone chat which at the moment are holding territories and, and are very easy to see. They come quite close. And some days when you go down and you mightn't see any birds out on the wetland, it may be because uh, we've had a visit from the peregrine falcon, uh, where you can see the fastest bird on earth in action now and again, all part of the ecosystem and spectacular to see. But there's a lot more to Harpers Island than just the birds. It's not just for the birds that we're preserving it. Here are some of the flowers you'll see if you walk down there. Please don't pick them. Take loads of photographs, but don't pick them so that others can come down and enjoy them too. Uh, fantastic selection, visible mainly during the spring, summer and autumn. You also have a surprising variety of mini creatures. Again, so even when there doesn't seem to be many birds around, you can find plenty uh, to explore when you're there. Lots of wildlife. Butterflies are very well represented. Uh, we've got quite a number of species. I think I've got all of them bar one, the dark green fritillary illustrated here. And again, the more you go down there, the more you'll see. Uh, different butterflies come out at different times of the year, mainly during the summers when you're going to see them. Uh, and uh, well worth keeping an eye out for. And in recent years, we've been studying the moths there as well. And so far, we've found 130 different species, 130. And we're sure 
that there could be at least double that number living in Harper's Island, uh, which is quite phenomenal. And you rarely see them. We have one or two day flying moths, the six spot burnet with its black and crimson wings. You might even see the black and amber caterpillar of the cinnabar moth. Now, I'm going to give you history of the project itself. This is the creation of the reserve. Uh, and we'll start with the main players. I know I'm going to forget someone in this talk to thank or acknowledge, so please forgive me in advance. The success of Harper's Island Wetlands has been the cooperation and the go-ahead attitude of so many groups of people. We had the Cork County Council who owned the property. Uh, we have Birdwatch Ireland with the Cork branch, very active and involved, who got the ball rolling with the original idea back in the 1990s. And then most importantly, the local community bought into it big time. We've got Glantown Community Association, the Tidy Towns and the Men's Shed. And uh, we've also got the NPWS, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, uh, making sure that everything we do is within the law and is not going to damage uh, the very delicate ecosystem that is Harper's Island. And it's, it's been a huge success. I mean, beyond our wildest dreams. And here is the timeline. It was back in 1993 that the idea of a nature reserve at Harper's Island was first proposed in a submission to Cork County Council. And uh, it, it, what really sparked this was the, we knew that the new N25 dual carriageway was going to go right through the northern part of the estuary of Cork Harbour. And we were concerned about that because we, we were going to lose some of the habitat, wetland habitat. And we thought uh, the creation of a nature reserve on Harper's Island would be one way of mitigating uh, the, the, the loss of habitat and also provide the opportunity to establish one of the first estuarine nature reserves in Ireland outside of Dublin and Wexford. I have to mention this man, Mark Shorten. He was the principal author of the, of the original submissions uh, to Cork County Council, both for the nature reserve and also we made a submission to the county development plan. Uh, here's Mark um, <laughs> uh, trying to negotiate with a stand of Spartina uh, on Harper's Island. It's an invasive species. Uh, luckily, it, it is not widespread and we're doing our best to control it. Uh, but yes, Mark deserves a lot of credit for putting in a lot of the donkey work and putting the uh, the Birdwatch Ireland proposal together at the time uh, with the help of other members of the committee uh, and from Birdwatch Ireland nationally as well. And that really set the seed of the idea of a nature reserve on Harper's Island. Then you fast forward 16 years and we still have hopes of getting this plan off the ground. It didn't get off the ground in the 90s. Uh, just the, the time wasn't right, the stars weren't aligned, you name it, whatever it was, it just didn't happen. But we have to mention this man, Derry Delaney. He was the Glonton connection. I was up looking for colouring to Godwits in Glonton, as I did quite a bit back in the 2000s. And um, Derry is naturally a curious man, and he asked me what I was doing. So I proceeded to tell him all about the Godwits and the colouring and how important Cork Harbour is for them. And I mentioned Harper's Island and the fact that we had hoped to put a, re a nature reserve in there at some stage. And Derry took the whole lot in. And not only that, but I thought I'd, I, you know, I talk to people a lot, quite a lot, uh, when I meet them out there, tell them what we're doing. And uh, I, I thought I'd hear no more from Derry. Well, within days, he was on the phone to me, eager to help make our proposal a reality. And within a year, we were sitting in the county manager's office of Cork County Council with a proposal for a wetland discovery centre at Harper's Island. This would eventually morph into the Harper's Island Wetlands Project. Martin Reardon was the county manager at the time. He had been heavily involved in setting up Spike Island uh, as, as a destination uh, for tourists and a heritage site. And Derry had the connections and got us the meeting. Alan Lauder, the then CEO of Birdwatch Ireland and Dave Sotheby, who was our reserves manager, they got involved. 
more members of the community in Glantown got involved, uh, especially the uh, community association at the time. And this is why we need to protect them. We went to his office and we couldn't believe it. He thought it was a brilliant idea, gave it the full backing of the council, and that was really the start. In that proposal, we did some uh, mock-ups of what it would look like, because I always believe if you can put in images, uh, people often see more in an image than reading blocks of text. So we mocked this up with uh, some very dodgy uh, photoshopping, and I took a photograph of my wife and son in the back garden, and superimposed it onto a photo of the railway bridge at Harpers Island and robbed a sign from, I think it's, you can see it, the use watch in England. And it, it got the idea, a mural along the approach wall, which we hope to do some sort of a mural, maybe involving the school kids at some stage to brighten up the approach to the island itself. And this was the original design, uh, a far cry from what we've ended up with, but uh, we, we opted for a bus shelter type approach didn't want to scare off the county council with something too expensive or fancy, and also something that wouldn't be considered open to vandalism or destruction. So this is why we went for this basic proposal. And they went for it. It was fantastic. Uh, so the project was up and running at that stage, 2010. And then we needed baseline studies so that we wanted to be sure that we didn't do anything to damage Harpers Island during the development of the nature reserve. So the first study was done uh, on the wetland birds, thanks to funding from CCAD, who have been supporters of the project too. And we got that done in 2014. After that, first viewing hide was completed uh, around 2015. In this photo, you can see the foundations of the first hide with the wetlands in the background. And we had to do all the work during the summer months while the wetland birds were away breeding, so there wouldn't be any disturbance. And, uh, the design by Sean McLaughlin, county architect, who again came on board, came up with a fabulous design, really brilliant design, uh, and uh, it, it went up in, in no time at all. And what has been a, a symbol of, of the whole project throughout, we had on the ground, Glownton community, Glownton men's shed, tidy towns, and Birdwatch Ireland volunteers all mucking in together to get to get things done. And... Uh, we ended up with a hide that we're all very proud of. And that hide was opened then in 2017. And here's my ugly mug in the middle, but uh, Derry Delaney's there. And at the back, we have Pari Lynch, uh, a key figure as well from the council. And with the dark glasses, Sean McLaughlin, the designer, Tom Geddings, just looking over the shoulder of David Staunton, TD, who was a supporter of the project from the very beginning, who performed uh, the ribbon cutting uh, you've got Anthony Barry, local councillor, on the, on the right. Uh, Anthony has been a huge supporter of the project from uh, the time he came on board and has done Trojan work uh, to get it to where it is today. Uh, also, uh, we must mention who is not in the photograph, Sharon Casey, ecologist with Car County Council, who has been a guiding light for the project uh, and a key member of the steering group. And... It has been a huge success. People in Ireland have been starved of facilities like this, places to go which are off the road, which are nice and comfortable and where they can view uh, their own wildlife and learn from it. Uh, and really it, it was a huge thrill for all of us uh, to get to this position. We actually couldn't believe it. We were pinching ourselves that finally uh, it was happening. But we didn't stop there. In the same year, we produced a joint Birdwatch Ireland Glownton community vision document. Uh, and in it, we had lots of plans, uh, some of which may never happen. Uh, but, you know, we dream big in Harpers Island. And that is why we've got so much done uh, so far. While we, the, the hide was being finished, we created a scrape, which is basically a large shallow pond, which wetland birds really love. And here we have Tom Geddings on the left, Derry Delaney. Uh, then you have uh, Conor O'Brien, another key figure from Glantown. He, he's got many hats, men's shed and tidy towns and association. And also from headquarters uh, of Birdwatch Ireland on the right, Dave Sotheby, who's the reserves manager for Birdwatch Ireland. And his huge experience uh, in other nature reserves 
helped us shape a uh, Harper's Island to make it the best place for wildlife. And here they are, four men outstanding in their own field, uh, discussing how we were going to put in the first of the scrapes for the wildlife. We had never done anything like this before, so there was a certain degree of trepidation, uh, hoping that all the plans that we had made and all the measurements, calculations, uh, would all work out in the end. And uh, it, it was incredible um, how, how well it worked. Uh, we were all delighted with the end result. 2016, you can see the hide down the bottom left-hand corner of the picture. Uh, it was being built at the time. Uh, we hadn't started the scrapes, uh, these wetland areas. In 2016, roll on a year, and the first scrape is finished and already full with water. And roll on a second year, and we had a second scrape made, and we had created so much more wetland ha habitat than had been there up to then. Hugely important for the wetland birds. Uh, and this happened in the space of a couple of years. And the proof of the pudding was, Within two weeks of finishing the first scrape, these birds, Godwits, Lapwing, Teal, and uh, Greater Blackback Gull, and Dunlin were all in on the scrape and using it. So since then, we have completed a second hide and a nature trail. Here's the site in 2013. As you can see, there's no hide, uh, there's no screening, for the wetland area. So if we were going to put in a nature trail, we had to screen off the wetland area from the nature trail, uh, or otherwise we'd scare away all the wetland birds. So coming forward to 2017, uh, when we put in the scrapes that I mentioned already, we used the material that we dug out to make them to build up what's called a bund or a screen and this allowed us to open up the island for a nature trail without disturbing the wetland birds. You come forward again, 2021, and here it is, all complete, fencing, everything put in, grass growing on the bones, perfect screen, and this allows people to come and enjoy more of the island. We had to go all the way up to the farmhouse, a huge amount of work. Uh, again, Car County Council, uh, Birdwatch Ireland and Glantown community all working together to get all this done. We had many site meetings. Uh, we wanted to figure out the best route for the nature trail. And I'm sure you will agree that if you've ever taken a walk on it, that it, it turned out really, really well. One of the goals of our 2017 vision document was to create a native woodland. And we did this with the help of Amongst others, on the left, Apple employees uh, who came out and helped digging out the ground and getting the place ready for the trees. And then we also involved uh, children from Carry Tool uh, Primary School. And they came out and they helped actually plant the trees. This gives ownership to the people of the area as well, of the nature reserve, not so that it looks like something belonged to them, to other it belongs to the community and that's that's an important part of it and having work days is a great way of cementing that bond between the community and the nature reserve and the saplings are all growing fine and hopefully in the next five or ten years we'll have a lovely little native woodland uh, down in the southeastern corner of the reserve another thing on our vision document was to put in two more hides and we were lucky to get going with the second hide this is called the scrape hide. You can see the scrapes out uh, beyond Derry Delaney there. Uh, and of course, you wouldn't be able to look at the birds unless you had somewhere safe to do it from without disturbing them. So this second hide was constructed in 2019 and it was Glantons men's shed, including the man in the red braces, Gary Tomlins, another key figure in the Harpers Island Wetlands Project, who did all the work on this hide Fantastic, the design and uh, the building of it. Uh, huge, huge uh, credit to them for putting this beautiful height together. And here it is. And look, you've got widgeon in the foreground, totally 
at home and happy with the hide, not not scared by it at all. That was a great success as well. So the second hide went in. We put in a reed bed area. We managed to get some reeds from the Birdwatch Ireland Cuscany Marsh Nature Reserve down the road, brought it in and spread it out in one of the two marsh areas that we've created. And this is what it looked like when it, in November 2019. Uh, you really had to have a lot of faith that this was going to turn into a reed bed. It didn't look like much at the time, but come forward to September 2020, one year later, and there we are. Uh, the reeds starting to grow, Phragmites reeds there. So we hope again in about five or 10 years, we'll have a beautiful reed bed habitat in this section of the marsh. An outdoor education classroom was also a goal in our 2017 vision document. And here we have some volunteers putting it together. And where would you get a classroom with a view like that? Just fantastic. And we hope that when COVID restrictions lift, we'll start getting groups in again uh, and telling them more about the amazing uh, biodiversity to be found on Harper's Island wetlands. Now, it's one thing setting up a reserve like Harper's Island wetlands. It's another thing actually looking after it. One of the first things we did is we wrote a conservation management plan. This is a working document that will keep changing with time, uh, but without a plan, you'll get nothing done. We discovered that from the very, very start of the Harper's Island Wetland Project. So we wrote up a conservation management plan, and we've been using that as a guideline to the work we have to do on site. Here, Tom is uh, checking the salinity levels in one of the scrapes. Very important that the all the conditions uh, are optimum for the wetland birds. We also need to find out everything about the place before we do anything to it, because the last thing we want to do is kill the place with kindness in, you know, through our management, actually make the place worse off than it was. So a very important part of that are baseline studies. I mentioned the wetland bird baseline study that we did in 2014. We also uh, continue to do other studies, such as here the benthic fauna, which are basically all the mini creatures that live in and around the mud wetland areas. This was surveyed in 2020. We have the grassland surveys coming up as well and a number of other surveys in the pipeline. Uh, we've got some stands of the invasive Spartina grass on the reserve and managing those is very, very important too. And helping us in that, we've brought in some of the best grassland management experts we could find. And these were these horses who will graze the wet grassland area and keep it in the best condition for biodiversity, including the wetland birds. And of course, for the horses, they're thirsty. So we put in a pond. And this is also another habitat. And I'm sure uh, we've had frogs on the reserve in the past. So hopefully they would find this uh, attractive along with lots of other insects and aquatic creatures. Uh, so in providing uh, a watering uh, pond for the horses. Uh, we've also created some additional habitat. Now the meadow area to the south will also need to be managed and um, as well as looking at grazing uh, using sheep, uh, we also want to try and use it to maybe uh, show people some of the more traditional farming methods. Uh, it was a, a farmed island for centuries as I mentioned already so it's lovely to actually be able to show people some of the traditional farming methods of old. Birdwatch Ireland is always looking for volunteers, people who would like to roll up their sleeves and get out there and do a bit of practical conservation work. And Harper's Island Wetlands has provided a great focus for that energy. The future, we have a lot uh, of things we would like to do at Harper's Island in the future. We're not finished yet. One of the most important things, Harper's Island has special protection at national and international level, primarily because of the wetland birds uh, that use it. 19 of the 53 species on Ireland's 2021 Birds of Conservation Concern Red List have been found at Harper's Island. And some of them are regular birds. You'd be surprised to know that the snipe, the black-tailed godwit, red shank, meadow pipit, and oyster catcher are all on that list. So 
in the future, providing the best habitat for these species and all the other species that use Harper's Island is our main priority. Engagement with the local community and visitors and the public is very important. Uh, and through COVID, we have discovered that Harper's Island wetlands has become a hugely popular place for people to engage with nature. And we don't have enough car parking space at the moment. But thankfully, County Council have uh, found the funding uh, to actually expand the car parking area. And this should happen this year. We have a third hide in, in, the, in the planning at the moment. Here we have some of the steering group out measuring out uh, the area to be used and here is a bit later we have actually the base uh, we have the foundation in place we probably won't get third hide done this year uh, primarily due to covid but we are very hopeful that by the autumn of 2022 we'll have a lovely seawall hide ready for action and the beauty of this hide is you'll be able to look out onto the estuary. So even if there aren't many birds inside Harper's Island, you'll be able to come here and look out onto the estuary and watch them feeding and roosting nearby. Uh, another thing on our plan is a San Martin uh, breeding colony. Uh, we're hoping to put that in this year. Education, 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 hugely important in Harper's Island. Bringing in school and community groups like this one being led by key project member, Paul Moore. To this end, we've recently finished putting together some activity books. They're aimed at primary school children, age, that sort of age, both for families and for classes that uh, intend to visit Harper's Island and also stuff for them to do at home or in the classroom. We got a feasibility study done for an education center. This has been one of our big dreams since the very start of the project. The feasibility study was done by the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust and uh, they did a fantastic job. One of the options for an education centre would be to re renovate the farmhouse and provide there an area for interpretation, a small little lecture area and maybe even a, a field laboratory for scientists coming to study various aspects of the biodiversity on Harper's Island. It's still in reasonably good condition. It is a fascinating building. We're not even sure exactly when it was built and we're not even sure what some of the structures are, such as those little sort of recesses on, on, uh, underneath the building itself. It even has a lime kiln built into the structure of the house. Another option in the feasibility study was to build an interpretive and education center overlooking the wetland. And here are uh, architect's drawings, uh, sort of visualizations of what it might look like. Uh, but either way, we'd like a space where people can come, as I say, and learn much more about the biodiversity of Harper's Island wetlands uh, than they would by just walking around uh, the nature trail or going into the hides. We may even have a shop, which would be a fantastic attraction, and maybe even a little cafe which would be really great. It would be lovely to be able to go out on a nice winter's day and have your cup of tea and coffee and look out onto the wetlands and observe the birds. As I say, we dream big in Harper's Island wetlands and why not? But the most important thing for the future is to develop a place for people and nature. And hopefully we might see you on the nature trail at Harper's Island wetlands sometime soon. Thank you very much. For more information on Harpers Island Wetlands Nature Reserve, check out harpersislandwetlands.ie or find us on social media. If you'd like to learn more about Birdwatch Ireland and the birds of County Cork, check out our website birdwatchcork.com.